Hi, everyone. I'm Patty Lutzke. I'm the uh, director of the product management team at for the Arbitex products. And uh, I'll be talking about Arbitex 8.2. Uh, first, I just want to give an overview of our releases uh, over the past couple of years and the general cadence. Um, you know, in general, we've had a maintenance release in the spring in, in the April timeframe with a larger release towards the end of the year. Um, for 8.2, it did get a little bit delayed in so it was released uh, instead in January of 2023. Um, the other thing I'll point out with regards to our overall cadence is that we did have a 8020 release back in 2021, but the 80 stream is now out of support. So we currently are supporting the 81 stream and the 82 stream. Um, as far as the highlights for 8.2, I'll, I'll go into each of these in more detail going forward. Uh, I will point out that the Creo view was updated for uh, this release. So first off is with regards to publishing from Windchill. So as, as many of you know, there are two workers on the windshield side that can be used for publishing. There's what's commonly recalled, called the APE worker, which is for publishing Arbitex dynamic documents. And then the SIS worker, which is used for service information manager publishing. And we have updated the APE worker. So it has the option to send the needed content to publishing engine in a payload. So this is similar to what the sys worker has been doing all along, where the sys worker always sent the data in a payload. And previously, the ape worker would just send the ID of the top level dynamic document, and then publishing engine had to reach back into Winchell to pull the rest of the content. Well, now we have this option so that the ape worker can also send everything that's needed in the payload. And this will be very important going forward. It, it positions us in a good place to be able to take advantage of some publishing improvements that they're doing on the Winchell side. Now, in, for, for the, uh, th this was implemented with the December release of Winchill. Um, and in that release, you can still do the old style publishing. If you have a publishing rule with the prefer adapter parameter set to yes, then it, it'll just uh, publish to publishing engine the way it always did. It'll send the seed without the payload. But if you leave off that publishing rule, it will create the payload to send to Arbitex publishing engine. And, and all the rest of the publishing will be the same. It, it's actually quite transparent um, to the end user, but behind the scenes, it's just doing this, this mechanism rather than the um, previous mechanism where publishing engine had to connect back to Winshow. Now, there is one uh, change with regards to getting this set up. If you are using two-way metadata rules, um, then you do need to create an extra configuration file. And that configuration file will allow publishing engine, uh, or it will allow, excuse me, the Winchell side while it's creating the payload to make sure that it is including everything that will be needed to in, insert the correct information into your XML for the publishing. And this, this was always required for the sys worker as well. If you were using um, the uh, metadata feature, you know, either the two XML or two way metadata feature for the sys worker. So now this is also required for the uh, ape worker 
if you're using the payload mechanism. So essentially what you need to do, you would still have your burst configuration rules as before, but you would also have this copy metadata config.xml uh, file. And it can either be, uh, if you're using the environment variable to point to your bursting rules, it can go there or else it can go in the lib folder um, in a custom or an application uh, directory. And then there is also a publishing rule parameter. So if you're using this, you would enable it with a publishing rule parameter. Okay, uh, another change coming in 8.2 is with regards to a setting that was introduced many, many years ago that was related to um, uh, data publishing. Uh, so many years ago, we rewrote the uh, Resolve document for styling interface. And at that time, we had this use new RDS parameter in Arbor text for data publishing. Well, that parameter can no longer be used. You know, if you're publishing data and there is some sort of an issue, it's best to report that to tech support and we will get it fixed. Um, the old RDS is basically no longer supported. With this release, we are adding our initial support for DITA 2.0. So DITA 2.0 is not officially released yet from OASIS, but in Arbortext, we do support editing and publishing of DITA 2.0. And as you can see in these screenshots, out of the box, we support both. So there will be categories for the DITA 1.3, and there will be um, categories for the DITA 2.0. And if you select 2.0, you can see we've, we've just added the 2.0 to uh, the names of the different DITA topic types and uh, maps. This is supported out of the box for our tech info DITA specialization, as well as for the data technical content. And uh, I think I'll go to the next slide. Um, just, just a few things about this. As, as some of you are probably well aware, the OASIS committee created DITA 2.0 to not be a backward compatible release. So they made a conscious decision that they wanted to reduce the technical debt and they removed the deprecated items. Furthermore, the OASIS committee did not ship uh, XML schema for DITA 2.0. So it's DITA 2.0 is only available in DTD form. And as I mentioned, it has not been released yet. But anything that has been added, you know, things of for instance, changes in the way that the data processing should be in 2.0 versus 1.3 is supported by our publishing uh, code. The data 1.3 support is, is unchanged, so it will work as it did. And, uh, Publishing also supports both versions. Essentially, the top level map, the version of the top level map that you're publishing will determine whether it publishes using the uh, 1.3 logic or the 2.0 logic for, for certain elements. Certain elements have changed what their publishing behavior is. So we don't technically support having maps that would have multiple versions in them. We don't prevent it. So you can publish that way, but in general, we wouldn't recommend that in a production output because you'll find that some of the, you know, the 1.3 topics might publish slightly differently than the 2.0 topics, depending on what the version of the top level map is.
Now, another change with Arbortex Publishing Engine is that we have introduced a um, cross-site scripting guard. So this CSRF guard is in uh, the Tomcat configuration. And a, a key thing to be aware of is that in Tomcat, in the Java options, um, in, in the Java tab, you must add this, um, the, the last line there about, you know, Java base, Java regex. Um, that is what will allow um, PE to, to work properly with this um, guard on. There, there is also a properties file, CSRF guard properties. That's in the E3, E3 web and folder, um, you know, essentially alongside other properties. So in there it are many configurations that you can do. Uh, in general, this is a Tomcat feature, so it's really well documented in, by, by Apache. Um, now, if you do have a custom application, then it'll be important for you to handle either a nonce or disable this cross-site scripting guard on your particular endpoint. So, you know, that's more for the partners that do custom PE applications. You need to be aware that this, um, this guard is in place. Another change that we've added uh, is related to our queued transactions list. So in Arbortext Editor, if you send a request to Publishing Engine that's been queued, there is a dialog box that allows you to see your uh, queued transactions. Well, now what we've got is for any user, you're actually able to see um, all the users queued transactions. It's just that there's the ability to redact or, or remove the details. So what we see in these screenshots, the top screenshot would be an example of seeing two of your own transactions that have been queued. In this case, one of them is complete. One of them has been queued. In the bottom screenshot, this would be what someone, a different user might see. So they can see that, that someone had these two transactions that correspond to what we see at the top. And then they would, but they would not be able to see, for instance, the document name or the name of the transaction. And then for their own transaction, then they can see all the information. And all of this is, um, configurable in our e3config.xml file. So you can configure how you want the queued transactions to work. But, but in general, this allows you more visibility into the overall queue. The other uh, change is related to our SVG support uh, for the BADIC uh, toolkit. Uh, there's now, uh, in the advanced preferences, there's a new preference, which is SVG external resources. And it has the four options for none, embedded, local, or relaxed. And this corresponds to the change in the toolkit from BATIC. Um, previously, we only had two options. There was a, a previous preference called allow SVG external resources. It, it could be on or off. Um, now, if you still have that, for instance, if it's still in your um, uh, Arbortex config file, the WCF file, then it's actually gonna take precedence. So in order to use the new preference, if you had been using the old one, you should remove it from the WCF file. Um, and again, you know, this is, this is uh, all documented as far as what 
what's available for these specific options now. We've also added a new site prefs setting. This is a little bit related to the payload that I spoke about on the first slide. And, and um, in, the, in the situation that the Winchell, as it generates the payload, it's going to be looking at the member links and reference links in order to determine what should go in the payload. And there have been a few few situations where, for instance, the links were incorrect for, for whatever reason. Um, so what we have added in the Winchell adapter site prefs is this option called always update links. And what it will do is it will update, it will scan the document and update any member links or reference links um, every time that you uh, update the document. So previously you had to make a change in order to get the links updated, but in this case, it will update them even if no changes were made to the documents. And uh, for 8.2, we've updated to use Java 17. That's the uh, long-term support release of Java. Uh, we'll support it with either Oracle or Amazon Coretto, similar to previous releases that were using Java 11. This, this change um, not, is not exactly to our software, but just to make you aware that we have uh, moved away from the PDF version of the software compatibility matrices. Um, so now, all the matrix information is tied to the product calendar, which is, is in the release advisor interface on, um, on the support site. So uh, all of the interoperability information, as well as anything else, is added now to release advisor. And I, I want to just draw your attention where the arrow is pointing. pointing there is a release note section that can be expanded. And that's where some of the additional information is. For instance, the version of Tomcat that we tested with, the, the information that I just mentioned about Java 17, and some of the things that were in those PDF documents that don't fit in the other sections, you'll find up in that release notes section. And, and other, other PTC products have, um, switch to be just release advisor uh, prior to this, but, but now we are making the switch to no longer publish this as a PDF. And just one last slide that I have, which is related to Arbortext IsoDraw. Um, we did release in November, 2022, we released Arbortext IsoDraw 7.4. And uh, what's exciting about this is that ISO, this version of IsoDraw is a native 64-bit application. So a number of the libraries were updated. Um, also, it now does have support for Windows 11. And that's my last slide. It looks like some questions came in. Um, uh, Simon, are you yeah. able to sort of help yeah. me out with, with where yeah, we stand right. with questions? Okay. Absolutely. There was a couple of questions about the version of Java. Um, okay. Somebody asked whether it's necessary to upgrade the version of Java for each release because this causes uh, mandatory regression testing for each version. So I'm guessing that's correct, right? Um, well, no, we were on version 11 of Java, I believe we, we moved to that for the 8.0 streams as well as the 8.1. And now we've updated, uh, as I said, to Java 17 for 8.2. Uh, I would expect we'll be on Java 17 for, for a little bit um, going forward. So, so, you know, it's definitely not every release. And there are um, 
uh, you can have both uh, versions of Java installed. You just have to switch between them either with an environment variable or an ACL command to, to switch um, Java versions. Cool, yeah, so somebody replied that there is a preference that needs to be set for the Java version that you're using. I think it's the path they execute or something like that. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's documented. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a question, are we developing tools to convert from Ditto 1.3 to Ditto 2.0? Um, no, we don't, we don't currently have that, um, uh, available. Uh, it, it, it is something that's come up, but, uh, it, it's not, it hasn't, we haven't developed it that, that yet. I think to some extent we need to see once, once the DITA 2 is released, you know, what type of tooling will be appropriate for that. It'd be quite a tricky job to do with specializations as well, I guess. I would think, yeah. Um, there's a question about, is Tech Info Application 2.0 now a DTD instead of a schema? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Since um, since they did not release the, um, the XSD, uh, I believe we needed to re-implement the Tech Info as a DTD on top of their DTD. Okay. And the last one, I think, is can you speak to why the change in the way APE works? Uh, sending a reference rather than sending the entire payload. Is it scalability, performance, or something else? Sure, yeah. For the APE change to use a payload, um, uh, there are a few, uh, I would say, two main drivers. Um, one is performance in that, you know, with publishing engine not having to fetch the content, um, we do get uh, you know, that, that performance improvement. But the other is really support for Winchell Plus, where um, Winchell Plus will be deployed uh, you know, as, as a SaaS offering by PTC. And so in, in that sort of a cloud uh, SaaS environment, uh, having publishing engine reach back into Winchell um, meant that we wouldn't be able to take advantage of the VCS publishing um, uh, uh, architecture that is uh, being implemented for Winchell Plus. So with this new uh, architecture where we are creating a payload, we, we in, in a future release, we, we hope to be fully integrated with the VCS and the Winchell Plus architectures. Cool, I think that covers it apart from lots of people asking for copies of the slides afterwards. Um, oh, sure. Can we do that through Maya? I believe so, yeah, we'll we'll find out how to make the slides available. Yeah, cool, I think that's everything. Okay, great, thanks Simon for helping. Um, so now, yeah, I think we'll move on to Simon's portion about um, Arbitex Layout Developer. If I can select the right screen. Can you see that okay, Patty? Uh, yes, I do. Okie dokie. So we'll have a pause after this, after the styler 8.2, if there's any questions on that before we get into the layout developer 12.2 stuff. Um, so the main thing for styler uh, 8.2 is that we've introduced a new uh, web frame set which uh, provides a responsive output rather than the rather static, outdated uh, web output frame set that we had before. So the new frame set uses um, iframes, which are much better than the old HTML frames. It shows and hides the navigation panel. So this panel here on the left now disappears if the viewport window is too small. And if you make it bigger again, it shows up again, but there's also buttons to show and hide that if you need to. Uh, try to make the look and feel a bit more updated um, and easier to customize. And we've also, um, as much as possible, kept the existing functionality we had in the old uh, web output um, in the new web output. So everything should work the same. 
you could just choose a different frame set that that is displayed in. So if you want to publish using this new uh, frame set, there is in the frame set option when you go to publish for web, there's a new option there for responsive. Default is the old one, responsive is the new one. And that will be available for all the document types that we ship. Uh, if you want to make that available for your document types, you'll need to edit your DCF files to allow that um, uh, frame set to be used. And that's a fairly simple thing. I think there's information in the uh, documentation about how to do that. The um, frame set only does the uh, like the surrounding stuff, the style sheet for the content inside the frame set is still part of your style style sheet, and that will work exactly the same. The chunking process works exactly the same as well, um, the chunk boundaries and all that kind of thing. All that is different is the way that all those chunks are pulled together, the table of contents are generated and the index entries are generated. So you don't have to do anything special to your style of style sheets, you just need to choose the different uh, frame set. The style, style sheet itself won't have any responsive layout capabilities built in. Um, you need to build that customization yourself, but it's not too difficult to do that if you want to uh, do that inside your style, inside your content styler style sheets. But um, normally in the experiences that I've had so far, it's not really necessary to do that. You can select the UI language from uh, this field here in the publisher web dialog and we've translated the ui components so things like button labels tooltips and there's a hint on the search field all that stuff is translated into the uis that we uh, currently support so we ship those out of the box and should you want a different ui language for your publishing needs then you can add your own translation files into there um, and we will that will be picked up automatically okay so these are the components of the responsive web output. We have a um, bunch of buttons up in a toolbar. This one here shows and hides the navigation panel. That's this area here on the left. And that's the thing that hides um, when you decrease the viewport size. Um, so if you want to bring it back, you hit this button here. The second button, this one here, shows and hides the uh, profile panel. It's like a filtering option down here on the bottom. And then we have like a, a topic navigation set of buttons here. So you can go forwards and backwards through the uh, table of contents or through the index, depending on which one is open at the time. These buttons here show and hide the uh, content, table of contents and the index. So if you click on contents, you'll see the table of contents as a tree. If you click on index, you'll see the index entries. And then we have buttons here to collapse and expand each of those items in the tree. And a search field here, which will search whatever's open, either the table of contents or the index. So you can find the topic that you're looking for. Here's a topic tree. This is pretty much the same table of contents as it was before, but we've updated the icons and you can obviously customize those yourself. And here's the, uh, the profiling or the filtering panel down the bottom. So if you make those changes, the content and the table of contents and the index will update according to your profiling settings. Try to make it easier to customize uh, this frame set than the old one. So you can customize the images. So in, there's an images folder inside the frame set um, where you can change the images. So if you want to change the uh, icons which you use in the tree or these buttons here or up here or even the banner, you can change those in the images. Most of the icons are 16 by 16 pixels. So just replace it with something new of that size and, and you're away to go. The banner, the logo graphic at the top here is called banner.png, so you can change that. And there's stuff in the CSS to allow you to customize the size of that thing. So what we try to do in the CSS, which is associated with it, so if you look inside the CSS folder, there's framework.css, there's some customization points. We try to uh, group all the commonly uh, customized fields together and use those as uh, CSS variables. So if you want to change the width of the navigation panel, that's this CSS variable here. Uh, the banner height is 50 pixels. So if you want a different size logo, then 
if you want it bigger, for example, then you can change the banner height and the CSS will make it bigger for you. The, there's the toolbar height, there's the, the border thickness. So that's this line here and here. That's set at two pixels by default, but you can change that and you can change the color of it down here. Okay, so this is, these are your customization points. Of course, you can free to write your own version of the CSS if you want, but um, we try to make this as easy to customize as you possibly can. So that's the Styler update. Uh, yes, Brian, the uh, UI language is done by XLIFs. Uh, the publishing process uses those XLIFs to populate the right thing in the UI that gets output. I think that's everything there. Cool. So let's move on to the layout developer updates. So. Layout Developer 12.2 has got um, a bunch of new features which make it easier to use the product, hopefully. Um, first one is workspaces. We've updated some dialog boxes, we made some changes to, to the debugger, and there's some minor changes. One of them is very important, so it'd be worth uh, paying attention to that because it applies to publishing from a publishing engine as well. So the first one is workspaces. Um, Layout developer users tend to want to customize the interface, uh, key presses and all that kind of thing. They might want to do that for different uh, users. They might have different um, application preferences, toolbars, menu items, that kind of thing for different uh, user types or for different customers. Um, what workspaces allow you to do is to quickly and easily swap between uh, different customization groups. So you can save out a new workspace. So saving out a new workspace will create a folder that's full of all the um, new versions of your application files. Uh, and you can also, you also get like a, an empty load and unload JavaScript file. So if you want to create and destroy a bunch of objects specifically for your um, application, then you can do that in load.js and unload.js. You can also use that for pointing towards different libraries, and that's a feature which is um, which we've added. I'll cover that in the minor features section. So you can save that. You can also load um, a workspace down here in the bottom right-hand corner of the interface. There's a the currently active workspace. If you hit on that, you'll get a load workspace um, dialog box that comes up. So you can select the workspace that you want to load. Hit load, and it will load that one. The load process unloads everything that's to do with the currently active workspace and then loads in all the stuff for the new workspace. If you select none, then that will unload all workspaces and it will refer, revert back to the system defaults. Okay, so it will run all these versions of these files which are in the uh, installation folder. There's a bunch of FOM objects and properties to help you manage that, um, as you'd expect. So you can run it from JavaScript if you want. So you can hook up a specific workspace to a specific template in its auto exec if you wanted to do that kind of thing. Um, as part of our continual effort to uh, improve the user experience, we've, we've updated a bunch of dialog boxes. So first two are the inline style and the paragraph properties dialog boxes. Previously, these were scattered across um, a whole set of different dialog boxes that you had to access through different buttons, that kind of thing, which is kind of a poor work user experience. So now we've grouped those together inside categories. We've maintained the category theme across a bunch of uh, dialog boxes that we've done in previous times. There's also a new frame properties dialog box. Again, this was one which was scattered across different um, dialog boxes. So we grouped all, the prop all those um, properties together for frames into one place, reorganize things a little bit to make it easier. Um, for example, if you hit on the, uh, the text contents category, you now have not only access to the stream, which is inside the frame, but all the text properties which are, can apply to that stream in the frame. So it's easier to find what you're looking for. Um, one of the new things for the paragraph and inline style dialog boxes is there's this option now to insert JavaScript um, or a processing instruction. So in the old days, you only ever get a processing instruction inserted, but now you can insert JavaScript. So um, by default, the 
object that will be changed would be formatting dot current style from the style properties dialog box or formatting dot current paragraph from the paragraph properties dialog box. But if you commonly use a standard um, object name, then you can change this in your document configuration dialog box, and so you can do that. Right? For example, I normally use S as a shortcut for either formatting dot current style or for um, the style that I'm applying inside a, a better script. And so I can change this to S and it saves me a bit of typing and a bit of deletion uh, for stuff going on. So inside um, JavaScript tags, you will get a, a line of JavaScript um, inside content, other content like uh, XML or um, inside of processing instruction based tag, you will get processing instructions. If you select the JavaScript and you get an out, um, a processing instruction output, it will be the JavaScript processing instruction. These also apply to um, layout editor as well. So these dialog boxes are, are being poured across to layout editor. Um, so everything sort of works seamlessly and the same across the two. One of the other advantages of these is that when we were putting together all of the properties for um, each of these three things here, the paragraph properties, the inline style properties, and the frame properties, we found that there were some properties which weren't um, actually exposed through any dialog boxes. So one of the advantages of doing this process is that we've now um, exposed those through these dialog boxes. One of those uh, obvious ones is the open type stuff that's in the inline style properties. So uh, you can now, from the dialog box, turn open type formatting on, select your feature tables and apply that, which is pretty cool. One thing to notice um, is that inline style refers to the F style object and uh, paragraph properties refers to the F paragraph object. So if you're going to be looking for leading in the textile properties, you're in the wrong place. You want to be looking inside paragraph properties because leading is a paragraph property rather than an inline style property. Okay, I think that covers that one. We've made um, quite a few updates to the debugger as well in this release. So for those who don't know, Layout Developer has a connectable browser-based debugger, which lets you not only write code, but do other stuff like interrogate the current page through the display panel, that kind of thing. And new for this release is um, a graphic preview of the current page. So I could show you that. I've got a document open in um, Layout Editor at the moment, and here is a graphic of the current page, and I can turn on different guides, like I can turn on style guides, and you can see that these little uh, icons appear, and it gets some style information. Or I can turn on line guides, and I can see uh, line information. So this graphic preview is um, based exactly on the same drawing instructions that the WYSIWYG view in Layout Developer, Developer can provide. But what we're going to be doing is uh, layering on extra information that you can, and extra things that you can perform in that graphic um, environment in the uh, debugger in the future. So we started off by providing information about the object that you're rolling over. Um, we're going to extend that in future releases to provide more information and more uh, capabilities there. One thing you can do with that information is add your own bits of information. So there are commands in uh, JavaScript, which allow you to um, add uh, information to those pop-ups, like your own custom information. So one of the things you can do um, for the style properties, for example, is that you can uh, say which style tag or which function was used to create the styling for that, or you can change the different properties which are applied, or you can specify the XPath location for the um, element which is being styled at that point. So there's lots of things that you can add to increase the functionality of that uh, graphic preview, which is pretty cool. We've also improved code completion in this version of the debugger. So one of the things which um, was a little bit frustrating before is that we didn't get in the uh, IntelliSense, I think it's called the um, code completion stuff. In the code editor, you can get a, a list of all the function tags which are um, in your document, nor could you get access to declared functions which are living inside JavaScript. 
Those are now exposed through um, the code edit window. So if you do content.functions uh, dot and then control space, you'll get a list of the function tags which are available. And in this case here, it's listing the functions which are declared on this object inside JavaScript. While we were doing that, we found that we could read the uh, JS doc, which is associated not only with the tags, but also the function declarations. And we can include that in the, um, the hinting, which is available. So people can write their own documentation. And just for extra good measure, we've extended it so people can load in their external declarations as well. So if you have a JavaScript library which you're using and you want to um, create some documentation for your users, then you can do that and sort of declare it externally and that can be loaded and unloaded um, using a quick uh, thing in the code. The final thing that we did for the code completion was add this docs option here. So all of the formatting object model um, objects now have this thing enabled. If you click on that while you're um, editing a bit of code, let me show you that quickly. Let's go to this tag here. So if I do uh, control I here, you can see there's a docs option here. If I click on that, it opens uh, documentation for that object or for that method or property um, in this site that we uh, now ship with the product. So this is a uh, website that's created from the definitions for the uh, formatting object model. You can search up here for different um, objects. You can search up here for uh, properties, and processing instructions, that kind of thing. Find what you're looking for. Um, so we try to help users with their documentation for the debugger and the JavaScript code. So a couple of minor changes. And let's look at the second one first. Um, you can now point to multiple library locations. When you um, develop an application for layout, layout developer, you can create code libraries, and those code libraries might include UI uh, customizations. They might include dialog boxes or templates or any, anything you want that can live inside those libraries. Often, um, prior to this, you would have them all in your install folder. But what we can now do is um, look in a number of different paths for those libraries. So you don't have to keep moving your, your libraries around the place and put it into your new installation, unload it or load it and all that kind of stuff. A bit of a headache normally. Um, so now you can say, right, I want to point to these paths for my libraries um, when you start up and you can add library paths, you can remove library paths, and you can sort of do that, all that stuff on the fly, Get tell a layout developer to reload the libraries, that kind of thing. So this kind of works hand in hand with the workspaces. So your workspace, you can now point to a different set of libraries for customer A, and then if you want to load a workspace for customer B, then you can point to a different bunch of libraries, and there's no interference between the two. So it keeps them nice and um, Nice and separated, and it's easy to manage inside the layout developer. So this one here is a little, um, a little bit of a regrettable thing that we've had to do. Um, we've had to remove multimedia publishing from layout developer. Um, Adobe have removed support for embedding Flash into PDF, which is the route that we used before for embedding multimedia, so video and audio in PDFs. Um, but their new method that they support, which is something called screen annotations, doesn't work. Um, every time I've tried to do it, it's led to Acrobat crashing. Um, about a number of people have reported it online in the um, Adobe help forums, and there's massive problems there. So just to keep on the safe side and to stop people having a poor user experience, we've had to remove multimedia publishing. And as soon as it comes back, in in support uh, in Acrobat and is safe and nice to use, we will enable the screen annotations so people can get their video and audio back into their PDFs. But for now, um, we've had to disable it because it is just not worth um, all the aggro because of Acrobat crashing every time it tries to use the uh, embedded stuff. So sorry about that. As soon as Acrobat gets back working, we'll, we'll make that enabled. And so um, it'll be a new method 
using screen annotations, using ALD, um, but at the moment it's just not working, so we can't do that. So as I said, this will also apply to uh, multimedia publishing from um, publishing engine or your style of based style sheets because it uses the same ALD APP engine underneath the hood. So that's everything for me, Patty. Have you got any more questions about this stuff? No, actually we have not gotten new questions. Um, so it looks like we do have a few minutes if anyone does want to add any additional questions to the Q&A window. No, I'm not seeing anything coming in. So um, I believe that's that's our webinar for today. Thank you all very much. Um, I will put in a quick plug for LiveWorks coming in May. Uh, we are, will be having a service symposium at LiveWorks that will include a number of sessions on ArborText. And uh, I'd like to encourage you all to consider um, attending LiveWorks in Boston in May. Uh, I think that's all. Thank you all.